This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Good evening and welcome to the Birch Aquarium at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. And I'm delighted to welcome you tonight to the latest Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science lecture. And it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Simone Bowman Pickering. And Dr. Bowman Pickering um, is an assistant research biologist here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And prior to her appointment as an assistant research biologist in 2012, Dr. Bowman Pickering held positions as a postdoctoral researcher and a graduate research assistant at Scripps. And she earned a doctorate of natural sciences, that's the equivalent of a PhD, in 2009 at Tübingen in Germany, where she also earned her master's and bachelor's degree equivalents. Her research covers behavioral acoustic ecology with a focus on marine mammals. She's interested in all aspects of acoustic behavior of a variety of marine organisms, in particular, echolocation behavior of toothed whales. She investigates daily seasonal and geographic distribution, behavioral adaptations, habitat preference, and food web interactions. Her goal is to contribute to the conservation and management of marine ecosystems which is a really wonderful and important goal. And so with that, please join me in welcoming Simone for her presentation entitled, Listening in the Deep, Using Sounds to Study Animals We Cannot See. All right, good evening. This is a big crowd that I can see here. I'm excited to talk in front of so many of you and to tell you about my fascination with um, the deep sea. So um, there are so many mysteries associated still with the deep sea. We know so much about, um, well, our terrestrial world and we know quite a bit about the ocean that is somewhat easily accessible to us say by diving where there's still light, where we can see things, right? But the deep sea is, for one, it's usually remote, not easily to get to, and, um, and then it's dark. And so in preparing for this talk, I went online and thought, okay, so what's, what's on the web um, in terms of deep sea? And so what you get are then scary creatures here, like this shark, and, and then even, so here this is in, in um, Cartoon Nemo, you see that scary anglerfish um, dangling a light to attract um, its prey. And then I found this, this is a really weird thing, somebody associated um, this fantasy creature with the deep sea. So essentially lots to be imagined, right? Because we don't know all the things that are. And when you now look at, um, the Crete, when you look at the more scientific side, then I found things like uh, creatures of light. So we know that a lot of these animals uh, use bioluminescence to communicate and at depths. Um, very little, though, is known about sound. However, at depths, right, you would think that sound is something really important that if you can't see, then you want to use um, sounds to, that travels really well over distance. And so I even found a title here of a book called The Silent Deep, and it's an excellent book of a, of a good colleague of mine here at Scripps. Uh, it's well worth a read, but its title is The Silent Deep. Now, I would like in this 
talk tonight uh, show you that uh, the deep is anything but silent and um, I hope I can convince you of that. So we'll start out with a few sound bits and I have to be creative here with this mic. One second. So the first example is going to be um, of deep diving cetaceans. They are, <coughs> in this case it's a sperm whale, but it could also be, um, say, beaked whales, topic um, of later on tonight. And um, they use echolocation to experience their world since light is gas and their vision really is quite poor. Um, and so all of their sensing of the environment and finding their prey is done via echolocation. And that sounds like this. So those are echolocation clicks and um, you send out a signal and you wait for the echo to return and that's your interpretation of, of uh, your environment. Now not only sounds that occur right at depth can be heard but also sound like I said travels very well. So a loud sound source in the oceans are also cetaceans that are at the surface. So um, dolphins are known to whistle and echolocate um, a lot. And so this is what we hear very frequently at depth. Now, something not so commonly known is that there are a lot of different species producing sounds. And, um, not all fish, but a lot of fish produce sounds. And this is not a deep water species, because for the most part, we don't really know how those deep water fish sound. We have the sounds, but we don't have the association to what species it is that produces it, because, like I said, it's difficult to study, right? Um, but for the toadfish, we know how they sound, and let's listen to that. <coughs> So that's a toadfish calling for a mate. And, um, and there's a number of examples. They all kind of, um, they all sound similar to this. Some are drumming, some are more like trumpets. Um, and then some animals don't voluntarily make themselves heard, but y you hear them as they go about their life, right? As if we are tramping along the corridor, or upstairs or whatnot. And here, this is an example of a uh, uh, bumphead parrotfish um, crunching on coral. And so there's uh, knowledge about um, sea urchins scraping across a uh, rocky substrate, um, even larvae is known to settle to the reef based on sounds that they perceive. And so a large number of species at different stages of their life rely on sounds for a variety of reasons. And now this is uh, an example of what we certainly did not expect to hear in muddy sand flats. If you think of sand flats, you'd think of uh, deserted area, right? Nothing much going on there, but completely wrong. I have no idea who is doing what they're doing, but to me, it sounds like a forest. Now listen to this. So there is chirping and clapping and all sorts of things going on. This is to demonstrate that no matter shallow or deep, there is a large number of species producing sound. Some of them we know how to, you know, to associate those to certain behaviors or certain species, but the majority of the sounds, quite frankly, we have no idea who is producing them. So there's a lot to be discovered. 
Now, the species that I've been working on and have been um, lucky enough to discover quite a few things over the past few years have been beaked whales. And beaked whales are the most poorly known group of large mammals. And there's right now 21 species uh, of beaked whales. That's a good percentage of all cetaceans. There's about 90 cetaceans right now um, that we know of, and 20 of those are beaked whales. Uh, we have no idea yet why there are so many species in this particular group, why they have evolved in so many different ways. Um, however, most of them we know little to nothing about. Some of them have never been seen alive. Like there's a, a, a species here called the Perrins Beaked Whale offshore of California. There have been five strandings ever documented just along the Southern California shore, and that is all we know of that species. And um, over the past decade, I guess, there have been a number of new species found. So talk about mysteries. Where can you find that, that um, large megafauna can be found still, right? I mean, here on, on land, usually we kind of know our big animals. But in the ocean, there's still a large number of animals that or species that we might be able to find. So it turns out that these beaked whales, however, are really sensitive to loud sounds. And there have been a number of mass strandings uh, now um, that have been documented to correlate with uh, Navy sonar events. And um, the Navy has put a large amount of uh, money into research now to figure out um, what exactly it is and what uh, circumstances um, cause these kind of mass strandings. Because it's not that every time uh, Navy sonar is being used, a whale strands. That's definitely not the case. So there has to be a set of circumstances to lead to these. And um, just briefly, active naval sonar, what is that? We have this offshore range right here uh, in, um, in uh, Southern California, and that is where a lot of our work is being conducted. And um, you basically have a ship at the surface and uh, some submarines swimming around. And um, the, during naval exercises, it's basically to turn on the pinger, if you will, similar to the fish finder that lots of people have, have on their private vessels, and to interpret the echo that comes back and find the submarine, right? Um, if, and those sounds are extremely loud, and if a marine mammal is not detected visually, and um, gets close vicinity, then it can be harmful, or at least it can be disruptive to their behavior. And that has been shown over a number of um, publications in the past um, years now that both beaked whales, but also large baleen whales, seem to be responsive to Navy sonar, but also to other loud anthropogenic noises, such as just general ship passages. Um, and so we still have our work cut out, however, to determine at what level are these um, sounds disruptive and what causes then the actual stranding. So here comes my work into play as well. Um, there are currently 10 species of beaked whales that uh, we know of in the North Pacific. And they range in size quite dramatically. The biggest here is a bad beaked whale with 11 meters, and the smallest is the pygmy beaked whale with not quite 4 meters. And then the most commonly um, encountered at sea, offshore here, would be the Cuvier's beaked whale. And then, um, you can find quite frequently in the more 
Well, like in the Central Pacific area, you would find Blainville's beaked whale more frequently. So the way people have been studying um, beaked whales in the past is um, to use tags. And that's a very convenient way. You stick a device on the back of the whale. In this case, it's an acoustic tag. It um, has acoustic sensor, it has a depth sensor, and it kind of can tell um, kind of the roll and pitch of the animal. And then you basically can track exactly the path that the animal took and at what point it actually emitted sounds. The problem with that is it's attached with a suction cup, and so the suction cup lasts, if you're unlucky, only a few minutes. If you're more lucky, it lasts several hours, maybe a day. Um, now, satellite tags, that's something entirely different. You basically, this is the picture here of a Blainville's with a satellite tag. You basically have um, metal prongs that go through, that penetrate the skin in the dorsal fin here where there's no nerves. Um, and this uh, satellite tag sticks for multiple months. It doesn't have the same information, obviously. It can, it can, um, tell you location, and it can um, send back dive depths, the newer models at least. And so you get information about diving um, and location. So with these data, people have found quite a bit over the past, I would say, five years is when we've rapidly gained knowledge. And this is now a picture of a typical beaked whale dive. You can see here the dive depths, and this is the time of the day. And up here you have a Cuvier's, and down here you have a Blainville's beaked whale. And you see that both of these species seem to be doing pretty much the same thing. They go down to depths, stay there for a while, and come back up, and then they do a series of more shallow dives. And those are usually what we think to, to decompress um, and to sleep or relax and, and um, get ready for that next deep dive. Um, they do that non-stop, no matter day or night. And you can see here too, those thicker lines is when they start echolocating. So they start echolocating only at about 500 meters depth when they think that they might encounter prey. And then those open circles, this is when they have a prey capture attempt. So you can see that once they reach depths, they're going to go crazy finding and catching um, what they look for, usually deep sea squid. And so this is something we had not known before. Um, when you look now at dive records, you can see that a number of uh, species go extremely deep. We have penguins and seals and turtles, and then sperm whale has been holding the dive record in depth, 2,000 meters. However, just I think a year ago or so, there was a tag deployed with a brand new dive record of 3,000 meters and staying down for over two hours. Now that's a dive record I'd call. So the tags also have been uh, showing us about how these animals use their habitat. This is uh, Hawaii, Maui, and the northern tip of Hawaii. And this is a tag of cuvies, a couple of cuvies beak trails over the course of, I believe, 25 days for that longer black one. And then over here, Blainville's beak trail. And you can see that those animals don't really go all that far. They seem to be using a fairly narrow range. I mean, sure, that's several tens of kilometers, but you know, still, that's not like going from here to, to Alaska in a week, right? And so they, they, they probably, even if we were to record them longer than this, they, particularly for the island situation, they probably would not go a whole lot further than this. It's different offshore here where we've had a tag on a Cuvier's beak whales, or colleagues have done that. Um, 
where the whale swam from SoCal all the way down to the tip of Baja, and then we don't know what else happened after that. But so there could be some further distances. Also, what we found out with the tags, and this time with the acoustic tags, is that these animals produce certain sounds that are species specific. And so this is a bit difficult to see, I notice, but here up here is what you call a waveform. It's an amplitude over time. This is a spectrogram where you have frequency over time and then the amplitude is in gray. And then down here you have the amplitude of a frequency. Now I'll explain what that really means, right? What you note here is that this signal kind of ramps up in amplitude and then it kind of ramps down again. So it's, it's kind of a slow increase in amplitude and a slow decrease again. In comparison, dolphins, they're much shorter and they ramp up immediately, full energy, and then kind of trickle down. So just the picture itself is already a good, a good distinction between dolphin, beaked whale. Now the beaked whale among each other, um, so you can see that they have kind of a, a, an increase in frequency over time. So it's a sweep. That only beaked whales do as far as we know. And then lastly, you can see the, the frequencies, the amplitude at each frequency. You can see that the shape is different here to there. And so just the frequency content of those signals and you know things like little um, peaks at certain frequencies is indicative then for the species. And so this is kind of a, a broad um, view of how we tell them apart. And I'm pretty sure that in, I'm going to show you more of those, but I'm pretty sure that you're not going to be telling, uh, you're not going to be able to tell the exact differences and that's not the point. Um, I would like to just point out that there are species specific differences and that with, with enough time spent staring at those, eventually you're going to be able to <laughs> tell them apart. Yeah. So um, now what do I do exactly? We um, put so-called long-term passive acoustic recorders in the water. Um, those are autonomous acoustic recorders that we deploy. Usually we like to put them at about a thousand meters depth um, and they sit there over months and record. And they record continuous and everything um, from very low frequency baleen whales to ship noise to um, fish and shrimp and anything that makes a sound is going to be recorded all the way up to the high frequencies of the porpoises. And these recorders we deploy in all areas of the world. So we can put them in the Arctic and you know, go there when it's kind of ice free, drop the recorder, walk away, and it stays there all year, and after a year we go back and pick it up. Now, that means we are not dependent on whether it's day or night, whether the sea state is a problem for us to do work, whether there's fog that we can't see a thing, um, and we can do it all season, right, year round. So one would say, okay, perfect. We'll do that everywhere, but there are, well, there are restrictions to that, um, not only financially, but also there's, if you, so there's different methods. So this here is a um, station, these are all stationary recorders. So they are anchored at a certain point and um, depending on what species you're looking at, you're going to have a certain detection radius. So for the beaked whales with uh, their frequency content, we usually, so the lower the frequency, the further the sound travels. With those frequencies, we have about maybe five kilometers detection range. So if, if a whale swims through and happens to point to our recorder, because it's not only that um, it's a matter of distance, but it's also a matter of direction, 
Um, if they point away, then they have to be real close to be detected. So if it swims through and points to the recorder, then we happen to record it. Otherwise, um, we will not detect that species. And then also, obviously, we're not there, right? So there's no visual confirmation. We will have to, in advance, know what sounds we're looking for. And I told you there's lots of sounds that we have no idea what they are. So what we do usually is we go out in the field, we see a species, and conveniently, marine mammals do surface, so you can actually see them, in the contrary to fish that are hidden at all times. Um, and you stick your hydrophones or your underwater microphone in the water and um, see what you get in terms of sounds. And, and the assumption has to be made that whatever you hear is going to be whatever is closest there in distance. Um, and so then the next step is after you found your, you, you got your signals, you have to say, um, what features can I use to discriminate between them? And I kind of showed you some of those features already, right? It's duration and frequency and um, whether it has a sweep or not and some other um, more minuscule differences. And then we, I think by the end of this year, we probably, we at Scripps uh, with the uh, Scripps Whale Acoustics Lab, have probably collected um, close to one petabyte of acoustic data for long-term recordings. So um, that's a thousand terabyte. That starts to be kind of a number where there's too many zeros, you can't really grab that. Um, so you don't want to sit there manually looking through stuff, right? It's, it's impossible. So what you want is an automated routine. So a lot of time is spent in front of the computer, writing algorithms that finds those features. And um, we're still by no stretch of the imagination there to have that all automated. So now the things that I'm going to be showing you here is um, from the North Pacific. So we've had, we've had recorders elsewhere, but this is the case study that I'll be demonstrating. Um, 26 sites here. If you add it all up, it's about 19 years of acoustic data. And it reaches here west coast of the US all the way up to the Aleutian Islands via the um, Hawaiian Islands down to the Line Islands over to Wake and the Mariana Islands. So quite a spread. And for those, we mainly look through them actually manually. Um, uh, not only myself, I can assure you that. A number of people have looked through that. Um, we've been able to describe bad speak male, long wind speak male, Deranyagala speak well, Steinig speak well. So for a number of species, we found those species specific signals. And for Deranyagalas, I'm going to be telling you a little story. So that's, that was curious. I was in the field um, at Palmyra Atoll, that's that, um, they, that was where I did all of my uh, PhD work. It's part of the Line Islands. It's a very isolated area. And we detected this acoustic signal. And it always came in a certain time of the day. And so we decided we'll go to the spot at that time of the day and check out what's there, right? Logical thing to do. And it turns out that we encountered a few times, not a whole lot of times, a few times, these big twirls here. And these are probably, well, I won't claim that it's the only pictures, but one of the very few pictures, there's maybe one person other than me that has pictures of them, um, of this species of whale alive in the field. And it's a mother and a calf. Unfortunately, I didn't meet a male, because usually the male is the one that you want to get to see the big tooth on the side of it. Um, and looking at those pictures, we saw, well, this is nothing that we have ever seen before. No idea what that could be. And so it turns out that um, two, three skulls have been found at Palmyra as well. And um, an Australian colleague took them and did genetic analyses. And um, 
she's been, she had been busy doing genetic analyses of a variety of specimen um, that have been collected anywhere. She's the expert. Um, and found that it matched with another animal that they found in the 60s in Sri Lanka. And back then, they thought, ah, no, nah, that Sri Lankan professor doesn't have any clue about beak whales. That's not its own species. And they basically booed him and put it um, into a different category. But no, it turns out that this is really its own species. And um, we've got genetic evidence now from a number of areas in the world, all tropical. And, um, and we have recordings of these animals now. And we also have. Um, pictures. And so we haven't found them alive anywhere else yet, but we're on the lookout to see where else that animal might show up. Now, looking through the data, just like I happened to run across this unknown signal and that we happened to find then in the field, um, I've been finding a number of other signals that I just call random names in, that are all of the property of beak whales. Now, so far, we know that every species we've encountered seems to be having one specific signal. They're extremely stereotypical, um, and they don't seem to alter much. And so the assumption is near that those signals yet again belong to a specific species. So what I've done in the next was, you heard in the introduction that I'm looking for a geographic distribution of, of species to learn about where we might be finding certain um, species. And so this is the, the blue shaded areas here and there and down here and this area here are the distributions that we know for ginkgo tooth, pygmy beak, parents and hubs due to sightings that people have um, had at sea or due to strandings. And so I, the black dots and the red dots are where we had our recorders. And the red dots is where we had a certain signal type. In this case, it's the signal type BWC. And so by matching where we find a certain signal type and what we know of the distribution of a certain species. We can put these two things together. And it turns out that we have extremely good matches that we now can most likely monitor acoustically, particularly interesting, I think, parents beak well, the beak well that has only stranded five times ever, that we've never seen in alive. We now can monitor acoustically. And um, it's not an abundant species by any stretch, but at least I think I have over the past, boy, I don't know, it was, I think it's also close to 20 years of, of recording all together. We found it 100 times. So obviously that's not a big number either, right? But at least now we know that the species is still present and that um, it seems to be occupying the area that we think it should be and, um, and we'll be able to pinpoint further down what exact habitat might be preferred because there seems to be kind of a separation on where we can find it. So maybe someday we'll be able to actually go out and, and see the animal in the field and get some more information on that. Also, by the amount of how often you count a certain species, you can then make inferences about how many of them might be there. So now, what I've been looking at is species composition. This is each of those circles stands for a site. And each color stands for a species. Now, what I think you should be seeing immediately is that each circle is dominated by one color, and strongly. There's only a few exceptions. So that means that at each side, there's one species that holds 
the fort, right? And all the others don't seem to be having a chance to um, make, make uh, themselves present. And um, the question really is, why, right? Why is there only one species per site? And it could be that there's something uh, like niche separation. We've kind of hinted to that earlier. Um, so this is Southern California. Mostly what we have in Southern California is Cuvier's wheat well. No big surprise. However, at this one site here, it's dominated by a different species, particularly Baird's big twill. So what makes this site different to all the others? In this case, it seems to be that it's not as steep, that it's not as deep. It's, I think, 800 meters versus the others are 1,000 and more. And so there might be just some, some um, a different composition of prey that could be assembling in different habitat, which then causes a different predator to be holding that niche. And for bats, which I've studied before during my masters, um, we know that they have a, um, they also have niche separation. And so, for example, here, these are bats that are open ocean foragers, uh, open ocean, <laughs> open space. I've done too much ocean work by now. Open space foragers, and these are edge space foragers, and these are narrow space foragers if they're right in the middle of the foliage. Um, and depending on where they forage, they have a different signal type. So it could very well be that depending on where the bee twills forage, that their signal is specialized for that particular task. And so there's still a lot of, um, to, a lot of thinking to be done. How might the bee twill habitat structure the signal and what kind of prey would be in that habitat? So that's something um, eventually down the road that I might be interested in. And so now, though, if you go to a different area of the world, if you look at the Pacific Island region, you can see, so Pacific Islands, I mean, the name says it all, right? There's an island in the middle of nowhere, and for the most part, um, it's kind of uh, the ocean desert in the subtropical, tropical area. There's not a whole lot. Of, of food to be had once you move away from that island or sea mount um, where everything kind of gathers. And from our perspective, what I can tell, there's not much difference to me from one island to the next to the next in, in terms of what I would expect uh, um, prey or, you know, there's no difference really in, in how steep it is. It's all steep. But you can see that the colors differ quite a bit. Again, you have a species dominating each site, but you have a variety of species dominating. And so there's something that we call patch choice. And um, for islands, it basically means that a species arrives at some island, and they find this area to be suitable for them in terms of quality, and then they say, OK, let's stick around. And the question whether or not they're going to be sticking around there long term is dependent, again, on, on what the prey quality is and how available an alternative patch might be. So if you found a good spot in the middle of nowhere, then the probability of you sticking around if there's enough food is probably high, right? Um, that might explain why also very rare species here or down here, that's the Deranyagalus uh, big twelve that we only know from that area might be dominating and occupying that patch, which then might explain why we have such a large evolution, there's a large uh, number of species that have evolved over time, that they come to a spot, it's suitable to them, and they stick there. And it seems like a lot of the areas where we go in the, in the, in the remote central Pacifics that we have new signal types, and with it, most likely, again, a different species. So this is 
kind of exciting to me that we might be finding some new species there. Um, one thing, however, that I would like to stress here again is that problem with the detection range. You saw from earlier that in Hawaii, one species was kind of sticking more along the, um, along the, what was that, the eastern side of the island, right? And then the other species was hanging out more on the northern end of the island. So depending on where we have our recorder, given that we have a limited detection range, that is going to change what we perceive dramatically. And so you want to sample very well before you make a conclusion that is more broad scale. So I'm looking uh, at um, cyclical patterns a lot. And when you look at cyclical patterns, you can look at um, small patterns like daily patterns or lunar patterns, or you can look at larger patterns like seasonal, multi-annual, or multi-decadal multi patterns. And the reason for doing that is that you know from yourself that your, your, your days and your years are very structured, dependent on what's happening around you. And only if you understand that structure is it when you're going to be able to detect a disturbance. So assuming you always only record during the day, but everything happens at night, then you're never going to detect the behavior, right? So that would be bad. So you need to have a full knowledge of those cycles to be able to make any sort of conclusions. And um, optimally, you don't only want to look at a singular species, but you want to assess the biodiversity and, and um, use all the sounds that are presented and maybe add some other information into the mix. And then you can you know, assess an ecosystem health and really detect if there are any problems. And so one example that I'd like to show here is um, dial cycle of a melon-headed whale, they can be monitored extremely well just looking at their acoustic signals. And the same goes for spinner dolphins that are highly similar. So for example, this is number of counts that we detect, number of times that we detected whistles, and this is the time of day. And here's nighttime, and the same goes for clicks. And you can see that the most whistles we detect in the afternoon, and that is when the animals are extremely active with each other, communicating, socializing, and um, yeah, they, they, they hang out usually kind of in the more shallow areas and, and connect with each other, right? And then as the sun sets, you see that whistling drops dramatically, echolocation increases, and that's when they start moving offshore and foraging. So they don't need to communicate as much, they still need to communicate some to keep together, um, to maybe help each other um, in the foraging effort. But then they're focused on finding prey, so they're clicking. And then as the night, set, uh, as the night um, ends and the sun rises again, they don't whistle nor click, and that is the time when the whole group rests. So you can see a whole picture of what they do day in, day out. In beaked whales, that looks a little bit different. I told you earlier that from tag data, we know that they always forage. Same thing you can say here. No difference day to night. However, there's this one signal that's called BWC, and we don't know who it is, but I would really like to know. Um, <laughs> and that happens to do a very different behavior. It's almost exclusively nighttime foraging. So you might say, okay, big deal. But that also means that this species is going to have a very different set of prey items that they're going for. And so they are going to inhabit a very different area. And, and um, Altogether, I mean, the, the reason why we want to know all these things, right, is to know if any of our activities are going to be harmful and interruptive. So for them, for example, if the Navy were to do exercises during the day, sure, probably not a big deal. 
Um, now, going beyond that, you can look at seasonal cycles. So this is um, from 2007 to 2013, peak 12 detections in Southern California. Now this is starting to be pretty impressive, I think. Um, I don't think anybody else has this kind of big to a record. When um, the um, fisheries science uh, center goes out to sea, they have in a given cruise probably, boy, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 or so encounters with big twelves. We have that many encounters in a day or more. And so you can see here there is um, kind of a seasonal cycle. So there's quite a bit of big 12 detections early in the year. And then in summer months, there seems to be kind of a low in most of those years. And then it picks up again towards the fall. So now the question is, is that a natural cycle? And why would they want to leave in summer? It's nice here, right, in Southern California in summer. Um, maybe does it have to do anything with anthropogenic sounds? And so what we've been finding is um, that fishermen use seal bombs to deter um, marine mammals to be caught in fishing gear. And this here is, is um, this here is like a firecracker sized little bomb that gets chucked into the water. And um, it's used in purseine fishery, um, set gillnet fishery. And I have an example, and I have to fiddle with my microphone. One second. Um, and you can hear a humpback whale, and then disrupted always by these explosions. Let's see. And that is actually, I just, I just thought it was interesting that we can hear the humpback whale too, but that's actually not a very, very loud example. They can be pretty loud. And when we look at um, those over the course of four years of data, this is, the, this is the date, and down here we have the hour of the day. And um, you can see this urn-shaped structure that is um, nighttime. And you can see that those explosions here in blue mostly occur at night. And there is months at a time where there's explosions in every hour of the night. And we've counted up to 500 explosions in an hour. And about close to 9,000 explosions in a month, uh, in a week, I'm sorry, week. So that's a lot of explosions. And it turns out that it matches perfectly here. This is market squid pounds landed in the Los Angeles area. It matches perfectly with the squid fishery. So um, question now is obviously, while it seems to make sense that that many explosions um, are disruptive, to not only cetaceans, but probably anything that have any sort of pressure sensor. Um, the question is, what kind of effects does it really have? And we saw um, in 2011, so again, we have here our peak 12 counts, right, with the dip in summer, um, that this is exactly the time period for that particular year where we had an increase in the use of explosives. So we were like, oh, wow, this is crazy evidence? Well, not quite so. If you look at the years before and after 2010, 2012, this does not seem to hold up. So you can see here that you have an increase in explosions a little bit later in the year, and that's exactly the time period when the whales seem to be showing up again. Um, so I think we need to dig probably quite a bit deeper to see what if there is a real effect. It might be that we have to look uh, at a finer scale in terms of actually sound pressure levels of those individual explosions. So how many of them are in an hour? How loud are they? Um, 
what kind of disruption might be caused? Is it maybe just a 20 minute break and then they keep going? Is that a problem? Maybe not. So we have to think a lot about this um, a little bit more. And then similarly, when you look at not only seasonal cycles, but if you go now even longer than that, multi-annual cycles, then it gets really, really difficult um, to interpret. And quite frankly, I think we probably don't have um, enough data right, yet, uh, right, right now for this yet, because we've been only recording a few years. And so this is just to, to, to demonstrate that. If you look at um, 2009 through 2013 at a specific site, you see lots of big grass here, still a good amount in 2010, and then it seems to be fading completely. Now this happens to be close to the naval area. Is it the naval activity that does it? Maybe. Um, if so, did they just go to the neighboring sites? We can't tell because we don't have that fine of a, of a recording grid. Or could it be that it's multi-annual cycles that's actually natural, right? Could very well be that um, if you look at the same thing, so this is again 2009 to 2013, and plot against El Nino and La Nina, so you see here your warm years, your cold years, um, and you calculate your, your um, correlation, it's a beautiful significance. So you might say, okay, wow, okay, got it. It's multi-annual, it's a La Nina El Nino uh, signature that we see here. However, if you go a couple sites over, this falls apart, and so you've lost your evidence. Um, and I, I'm just showing you that to have a lot of data is, uh, is, is wonderful, but also a curse. Um, <laughs> and there is, we see a lot of patterns, but we still don't quite understand them. So we still have a lot of work cut out for us. Um, to really understand what drives the presence of these animals here, to what drives their behavior. We have no idea what their prey does. It's a complete mystery to us because we can't really measure it. Well, we can, but so we have to think about ways of actually incorporating that and doing it, and, and then to see how that all comes together. So there's a lot of mysteries to be solved in that part. And I think only if we know that, to get back to the beginning, are we going to be able to understand why things are harmful and what exactly, what circumstances exactly then cause um, death, deaths or reduced populations and such. So as a summary, I'd like to stress that I hope I showed you that DBC is not silent by any stretch, that soundscapes, so the, the, all the sounds looked at together, vary largely dependent on where you put your recorder. And so there's a different species composition, different behavior, and that you can learn, however, a huge amount about the ecosystem health at that particular spot and detect disturbance once you've understood all the patterns of those sounds. And I think that uh, listening in the deep can help solve some of those mysteries that I've talked about in the beginning and I hope that you agree with me after having heard this. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd like to acknowledge the numerous um, labs and centers that contributed to this work, because nobody can do such a grand work by themselves. And obviously, much so, all the funding agencies that have given money to pursue this work. So the question was whether beaked whales are territorial and would defend their territory against other species. And um, 
I don't know the answer to that question. I, we, I don't think anybody has observed any inter-specific territorial aggressive behavior. And the data I showed you with one species dominating a site might be an indicator, but I couldn't say. <laughs> So the question was if there's work being done in the Atlantic Ocean. And yes, um, well, we as Scripps here are doing work in the Atlantic together with collaborators um, at Duke, as well as the Southeast and Northeast Fishery Science Centers. Um, and then there's a number of European labs that do work off of um, England and Scotland and Norway, Iceland and those waters. And um, there are a few other species of beaked whales in those waters, but some of the species cross oceans. So it's the work that is being done in the Pacific matches quite well with, with the Atlantic. So the question is whether the signals change um, depending on age, sex, or whether there is a different species in the area. And the, question, the answer is, again, we don't know. Um, there is, however, variability in the signal. So the, while they are stereotypic and different enough from each other, um, in terms of from species to species, there seems to be, well, there is variability within as well. And <clears throat> that variability could come now, like I said earlier, from the directionality of the signal, depending on how the signal is being pointed to the receiver that changes the properties of it. Um, but it could very well also additionally be dependent on age and um, sex. And there seems to be some evidence that the peak frequency of the signal is dependent on the size of the animals. So that larger beaked whales tend to have lower frequency signals. So it would make sense then that within a species that most likely larger males might have lower signals to females or young ones. But we don't have any data to support that in any way. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for a really intriguing presentation. Thank you.